Well, hello, church family. According to my watch, it is 1,200 local. Uh, I expect uh, my big yellow hound moose will interject it several times on today's uh, uh, devotional because he's been particularly vocal this morning. So we'll see how that goes. I pray you are well today and are abiding and resting in the Lord. It's a beautiful day that the Lord has made. It's overcast and rainy. So it's relatively cool and you're saving money on your electric bill and life-giving rain is falling on our lawns and gardens. So those are things we should be uh, thankful for. Um, For our daily devotionals, we continue to pray through the Psalms. And since it is uh, the 14th of April, as you might expect, uh, we'll be in Psalm 14 today. It's a great Psalm to study, reflect upon and pray through today. As is my habit, I'll provide a general overview and context for the psalm and then read through it and expound on certain verses as appropriate. And finally, we'll pray the psalm as our daily devotional prayer. So go ahead and turn to Psalm 14 as I set the stage. You know, the 150 psalms, uh, the authors of 100 are generally agreed upon, with 50 being totally anonymous. Regarding Psalm 14, no one knows for certain who penned the words. As it is among the uh, first 72 Psalms, it's generally assumed that it was written by King David. But in fact, the Psalm itself is anonymous. No one knows for sure if it was written by King David himself or a psalmist in King David's court. Irrespective of whether David himself or another poet in his court wrote this Psalm which is entitled to the choir master of David, it is likely written sometime during the reign of King David between 1020 and 975 BC. So think about that. That's 2,000 years ago. One interesting feature of Psalm 14 is that it is nearly identical to Psalm 53. The two were probably alternate versions of the same hymn before both were included in the Psalter. That'd be kind of like somebody capturing one of my uh, first versions of this um, this presentation and this version and including it in a book. Both psalms mourn the fact that mankind, mankind does not seek after God and thus treats God's people cruelly. This hymn was probably composed at a time when the people of Israel were pressed hard by the surrounding enemies. We must keep in mind that the psalm was written for the people of Israel a thousand years before the advent of the church. The meaning of the text is found within that context. Yet the psalm is timeless in its applicability. The emotions evoked and the wisdom conveyed are equally applicable to the church today, some 2,000 years after it was written. For like We are God's covenant people, too. Like the people of Israel, we, too, are his covenant's people, the church. Now, commentators differ regarding uh, what genre this this psalm falls into. And that's because it contains many elements of different genres. Uh, It contains elements of the individual lament, the uh, wisdom um, psalms, prophetic psalms, communal psalms lament, and the philosophical psalms. They're all present within this very uh, psalm, uh, both 14 and 53. So it's not easily categorized. The commentator for the um, English Standard Version Bible uh, sees it as a communal lament, and in that he's not wrong. But it certainly contains those other elements as well. For example, the contrast between the fool And the one with understanding is representative of the wisdom psalms. And verse 7 is clearly prophetic, and we'll see that shortly. So the Old Testament scholar Eugene Merrill has called it a psalm of exhortation, and it certainly does that. It exhorts the reader to have faith in the ultimate judgment of a righteous God who loves his covenant people, the people of Israel and the church. God will deal with foolish evil doers. So let's read the psalm together. 
Again, I'm reading from the English Standard Version, so the wording may be different from the text you are reading. So let's look at Psalm 14, beginning in verse 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they've become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge, all the evil doers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There are, they are in great terror. For God is who is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. Praise the reading of his word. Let's look at each verse so we don't miss what the Lord would have us learn today. So verse 1, the fool says in his heart, heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. As the ESV commentator notes, there are three Hebrew words for fool. And all speak of moral orientation rather than intellectual ability. The fool, here it is the Greek word nabal, is neither ignorant nor an atheist per se. The word is synonymous with wicked, who aggressively and intentionally flouts his independence from God and his commandments. As Thomas Constable says, quote, he is a person who has a problem in his heart more than in the head. He does not take God into account as he goes about living and is morally insensitive. He may be may or may not really be an atheist, and he is not necessarily ignorant, but he lives as though there is no God. One can think of First Samuel verses, uh, chapter 25, verses 25. Nabal, the worthless fellow, Abigail, his wife, described him to David. That's an example of a fool. The fool in his heart denies the practical import of God's existence. He shuts off the affairs of this world from divine intervention and denies any personal accountability for his actions. He disregards the revelations that God has given to himself and focuses attention the attention for which is essential for wise living. That describes so much of the world today. The psalmist had in mind the strict division of the world between God's people, Israel, and the Gentile nations standing in hostility to them. In short, the fool lacks wisdom. This Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of, the knowledge, is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Of course, as I've already noted, the psalm is just as applicable to the state of affairs between God's new covenant people, the church, and that of the unbelieving world. The words of Paul to the Romans ring out in Romans 1, verses 21 through 22. Paul writes, For although they knew God, they did not honor God, honor him as God, or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. That does describe most of the world. Sadly, that also includes the apostate, who have heard the word and have rejected true relationship with God. Biblical scholar Wilhelm van Gemeren notes, Within the congregation, he may mimic the sounds of faith, but his true self shows disregard for God, his commandments, and his people. He is characterized by an absence of concern or love for others, but he is occupied solely with himself. 
The three phrases in verse 1 describe the wicked. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile, i.e. detestable acts are done out of complete disregard for God's majesty. And there is no one who does good. That's a summary statement about the absence of godliness. Verse 2. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. We hear Paul here, don't we? In verses 2 and 3, the psalmist presents the Lord's perspective of the Gentile world. In verse 2, the Lord looks down. As the Hebrew is that he bends over and looks as a witness and judge on his creatures and observes the affliction of his children. In context, the word all in verse 3 refers to the Gentiles who are in view in verse 2. The psalmist draws the distinction between the company of the righteous, the people of Israel, and the Gentile fools. What he sees in assessing our condition is a world in which all human beings have turned aside from the wise way of fearing the Lord. The result is they become corrupt. The Hebrew, Allah, literally sour milk, morally, or sour. No one does good. A study of the Old Testament clearly shows there were many fools among the people of Israel too. Evil, corrupt, rebellious behavior against a holy God was not limited to the Gentiles. Indeed, it was such behavior that ultimately led to judgment upon the nation of Israel and their subsequent exile to Babylon. Indeed, the Apostle Paul clearly understand, understood the universal depravity of man when he expressed this great truth in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yet there's hope. As Paul continues in verse 24 of Romans 20 of uh, chapter 3, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to receive to be received by faith. Verse 4. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? They are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Uh, here we see that we what uh, may be called the prophets, prophetic perspective of the psalmist as expressed here. The person speaking here may be God or it may be a pious Israelite. It doesn't matter. Either would appropriately talk about my people. The Lord is the refuge of the wise, called my people, the company of the righteous and the poor. Fools, that is Gentiles identified in verse 3, are not even numbered among the people because they are evildoers who do not know the Lord intimately or care about his looking down from heaven. They are not part of his people, the company of the righteous. What behaviors characterize the fool? Fools busily pursue their self-interest and in so doing devour God's people. Their hatred of righteousness and the vulnerability of the righteous combine to make the wise easy prey. They devour the possessions of others and add to their own, completely disregarding the rights of their subjects. The psalmist in his lament has painted a dark picture that he doesn't end on dejection. No, he switches to exhortation, proclaiming the coming redemption of the people. There is a sudden switch with verse 5. Note that. Suddenly, God's judgment will come suddenly without warning on the wicked. The power and terrorizing will come to an end when the Lord intervenes on the, the behalf of the covenant people. Then dread will overtake the fools, while he, the righteous will enjoy the presence of the covenant God. How do we see this as applying to the church today, the world today? Well, the world continues to debase itself, with a majority living as fools, consumed with self-love 
and the pursuit of their self-interest with complete disregard for the statutes of the Lord. Indeed, in total denial of his sovereignty, majesty, and justice. I know this can be exasperating to believers. It certainly is exasperating to me. The church, both individually and collectively, though, can expect to be mocked and ridiculed and even persecuted. Yet we are to abide in the Lord, steeled by the sure knowledge that he is faithful and just, and that the righteous, those who are saved by the grace of God the Father, and being sanctified by the work of the Holy Spirit through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, will ultimately enjoy the presence of our covenant God. Finally, we see close at verse 7. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. What a wonderful verse. Though at first glance the verse retains a tone of lament, it restores confidence and faith with a promise that the people will surely be restored. The psalm has suddenly and gloriously become a psalm of prophecy. The psalmist anticipates an era when God will vindicate his people and deliver them from the fools that oppress them. The phraseology that we see, restore the fortunes, is characteristics of the prophets Ezekiel and Zephaniah in their description of an era when Israel would be restored to the land and again enjoy the blessings of God. After the exile, God demonstrated his faithfulness by renewing his blessings, by restoring Israel to the land and permitting the temple to be rebuilt. Here, the psalmist expresses the hope of the righteousness. It is an, a most appropriate prayer for salvation. Interestingly, the Hebrew word for salvation used here is Yeshua which is, you will immediately recognize, is the root for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua. It means to deliver or to rescue. And in regards to Christ, he serves. The psalmist were prophetically looking forward to the salvation of Israel coming out of Zion because the Lord dwelled in a special way in his sanctuary. Our sanctuary is not a building of stone atop atop Mount Zion, also known as Mount Moriah, but in the holy temple of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' coming, Jews and and Gentiles are further assured of God's concern, vindication, and presence with his people. Our fortune was restored through the resurrection of his broken and bruised body on Easter Sunday. That is where our hope eternally lies. So in conclusion, let's pray through Psalm 14. Oh, Father God, holy is your name. We thank you for your words expressed in Psalm 14. You say the fool says in his heart there is no God. And Lord, we know that through personal experience. We see that all around us. The fools are corrupt. And they do abominable deeds. There is no good absent the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for those fools. We pray that in this time of the coronavirus that many of these fools will be stopped in their tracks and will ponder what's going on about there. And in their fear, they will turn for comfort to you, Lord, and they will come to know you. Lord, that is our prayer. We know that good will come out of this pandemic that rages around the world. Lord, the Lord looks down from heaven on the children of men, to see if there are any who understand who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Lord, we recognize that. We recognize that absent your grace and your mercy and salvation in Jesus Christ, we stand condemned already before a holy God. There is no good in us, only good in you. 
Hath they no knowledge, all the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great terror, for God is with the regeneration of the righteous. Lord God, we know that we stand righteous before you through the covering, the propitiation of our sins through Jesus Christ. He has bought us, and we are now yours. And we know that there is a day coming when the unbeliever believers will be struck with great terror and that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. Lord, we live for that day. And until then, Lord, let us be bold in proclaiming your word among the unbelievers. Let us be faithful servants in your fields because the harvest is ripe. Lord, we pray that hearts will be moved and and softened and that, that, that many will come to know you during this difficult time. You would shame the plans of the poor, that is the unbelievers, but the Lord is his refuge. Lord, we take refuge in you. We are the poor in spirit and we take refuge in you. Oh, that salvation for Israel will come out of Zion. Lord, we praise your holy name and praise the fact that salvation has come out of Zion in the name of Jesus Christ. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. And Lord, we are glad because we are covered and saved in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together virtually and study your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this day. And I pray that you all stay dry and uh, stay well. Amen. God bless. Until next time. Love you guys. Bye.